So do we go to the next one? It would be um, about transdisciplinary research as co-production of knowledge, and then about thought styles or epistemologies, right? <coughs> to start with, I give you a very, very simple model of society and how society decides things. That includes four different actors. I took that from uh, Aunt Elzinga, who That's worked here. here. <laughs> yeah, who was here at, at Gothenburg University, yeah. Histo uh, History of Ideas, I think, was his professorship, and Andrew Jamison, I think. On the, and I mean, behind that is the story that um, some people said that societal development is um, an interplay between the science system, the governmental system, and industry. That's the triple helix model, and then Aunt Elzinga and Andrew Jam Jamison said, oh no, civil society is missing, basically. So it's an interplay between civil society, the science system, bureaucracy, and economy. I go through very, and I first go very, very quickly through the three ways of linear models of how knowledge flows, right? And the co-production is like the answer uh, to the linear models, right? But the linear models are still rather uh, strong in our thinking. One is called Sorry, speaking truth to power. The idea is that, and that's uh, the idea is that scientists find truth. They have to transmit it to the powerful decision makers, and then decision makers will come up with rules, and then society will change. And I think the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is somehow going in that direction, right? So they have this oh, every f whatever six years, five years, they have a new report. What is the state of knowledge about climate change? And then they have a summary for policymakers, which is like the speaking truth to power, where they on two pages summarize these 5,000 pages on what is the state of science agreed between governmental agencies and scientists. They have a line-to-line -line approval. <coughs> and then somehow they expect the governmental agencies to decide goals, to a degree goal which is a bit a mixture of science and politics, right? And then the two-degree goal will change perhaps the way of how we uh, burn coal and, uh, and fuels. Speaking truth to power. Very influential, I think, in if we look at how scientists think they should collaborate, that's still very influential. The whole IPCC, then there's IPBC uh, about biodiversity, there's IP chemistry about chemical pollutants, so there a lot of scientific um, or environmental problems are still run according to this kind of model. Then there is a, what is called technology transfer or translational research in the field of medicine and health. It's basically the idea behind that is there is science, we invent things, we have to collaborate with industry so that those uh, breakthrough insights will get to the market. In the fifth, uh, sorry, in the eighties or so, it was very uh, common to create technology parks. I don't know whether you have one in Gothenburg, in Zurich, we have a technology park. The idea was that you have to bring together scientists <coughs> who do in interesting, develop interesting technologies. In spaces like this, you have to have places where they can work, you have to have coffees where they can exchange, and you also bring industry people into the same areas, and then they will exchange and find solutions and bring them to the market. I think the technology transfer and the technology parks is a good example of how important this way of thinking was and still is. And then you have public understanding of science, which is basically what we do with uh, exhibitions. In Zurich, we have um, every year a large, uh, called Scientifica, I think, a large exhibition where the universities and uh, technical high schools present whatever they think should be presented to the public at large. But also our whole education is public understanding of science. Oh, a lot of documentations on the TV, that's all public understanding of science. The idea is that we have convinced the others they have to know what we know, and then they will behave as we will. Yeah. Basically, for the public understanding of science. That's what I try with you today, right? <laughs> 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 That's the linear models. They're really, I mean, the, the social studies of science, the people that look at the science system and how it interacts with, uh, with the public, they would say they're so wrong. On the other hand, they're extremely well embedded in how we, in, in our everyday uh, life, right? And they're all based on the idea that there is something like basic research that is then applied, that is then used in products. 
or that is that there is knowledge created that can then be translated and transferred and all this kind of linear thinking right <coughs> which is Stokes has written a book about the upper part where he says it's not true, basic and re uh, applied research doesn't follow from basic research, those things have to be distinguished. Some people do basic research with no application in mind. Here I think his example is Niels Bohr. Some people do applied research with no science in, in mind. So the example here is Edison who created the light that is now uh, uh, at the end of his lifetime. And then he says some people create always collaborative industries, uh, do problem solving and create whole new theories. And the example here is um, uh, Buster, Louis Buster, who created a whole new field of medicine, always collaborating with industry. And that's what he calls use-inspired basic research, basically. So that's why it's not true, this kind of distinction. There's also use-inspired basic research. And the Swiss National, Foundation, Swiss, Science, Swiss National Science Foundation took that up. So you can now, if you write a proposal and you think you're doing basic research in an applied field, you can tick the box of use inspired basic research. And if you then tick the box stakeholders, that's what they call transdisciplinary. It's their framing. This, this is the linear model, you know, the idea that I do some research and then I have my project and then the results will influence whoever. Uh, is the, the, this kind of idea of decision maker not true? The transdisciplinarians say that's not true. This person has, sorry for the rubbish, the idea would be that to say that this person has a lot of things in mind already. They're not waiting for our results. Why should they? They are influenced by other projects, they're influenced by other decision makers, they're influenced by other governmental agencies, other people try to sell them things, they have to think about who is voting for them, they're influenced by NGOs, huge mess network of influences and we usually tell that to the researchers that the red part is what you provide but that's like how you have to think of yourself right and this person doesn't wait for you he or she is just saying how does that fit you know to what i already know they're not empty they're full of things and you know how does that help me with my intentions <laughs> basically <laughs> so that's I mean, and because we transdisciplinarians think it's like that, so that's why we come up with co-production. We think we should not produce something and then send it over there, but we should include, from the beginning, in include those people in our research, right? Here I have a definition of merit, <laughs> of co-production. <laughs> you can read through, and if you have questions, <laughs> you have to ask merit. <laughs> well, I think I'd rewrite it now. <laughs> I think it's a good one. Great. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> 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 I feel like it has to start with the, like, can you, if you already have a research project in action, you realize, you know, this could really benefit from a transdisciplinary approach, but the, the original problem formulation isn't joint. Is it still co-production? Like, how flexible can one be in the interpretation of? Yeah, I think that that's what, what I would probably change. Okay. Because this is more of an ideal. This is kind of the ideal. Exactly. Um, the way it, that you want it to happen. <coughs> but I mean, I think in real life, um, the, the co-production goes in and out. Yeah. Maybe you, you starting, maybe a lot of it's like not co-produced at all, but then you, you dig in and you start doing things. So, so this was kind of more just kind of like, it also kind of naively, this is what I thought. <laughs> more, I had more experience, but it's never going to be ideal. Yeah. But I think well, the reason I wrote it like this was that I would take away entire, but yeah. um, just that the, because um, some of the things that were being called transdisciplinary <coughs> weren't really, were really being initiated from researchers and weren't really taking on board. It was more like applied research or more kind of typical where, oh yeah, well we talked to practitioners, or we talked to, you know, it was more mm -hmm. kind of like more traditional research and that's what I was trying to get away from. Okay. But that to say that it, the initiation also needs to be something that you talk about, which is, oh, 
So that, 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 that would change. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I personally don't care whether you call it co-production, but I think it's great if you go in that direction. Whether you fall into this definition, category of definition, but I think it's great. Include whenever you can stakeholders, right? So it's okay if you dip the toe, you don't have to dive in. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's very true what, what Merit said. It's like this ideal. We always talk about the ideal transdisciplinary project, which is far from. It's in the heavens somewhere. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah it's not in reality. No, no. Here is a, a kind of a um, graph that tries to <coughs> show the process of co-production. <gasps> now that's more symmetrical, yes. right? <laughs> Are you happy with that one? <laughs> well, that's really a big problem, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but still on the left-hand side, you see somehow what we call here the realm of science, rigor and understanding. That's the main question, is it true? On the right-hand side, it's a bit different. You see the, what we call the realm of practice, relevance and design. The main question is, does it work? They don't care whether it's true or not. Architects don't care about whether a house is true. It has to not break down, right? The bridge the same. And we said transdisciplinary research is basically the idea of bringing both realms together. And the arrows, they mean knowledge production, the big arrows, or the arrows in principle, I mean the round arrows. Um, that they come together in this red part means co-production. So you produce people from within the science system together with representative of, of the practice world, go through a process of co-production, co-learning, whatever. Ideally, this starts with problem framing, <laughs> which should be a first phase that is paid by the uh, whatever agency, by the funder, which is not done usually. And then it goes through a phase of analyzing the problem and then goes into a phase of exploring the impact. And exploring the impact means feeding back with papers into the science system. That's not wrong, but it shouldn't be the only, the only part. And feeding back into the realm of practice. Very often with policy briefs or whatever, but it could be anything. The idea would be that at the end of that process, society handles this issue differently and science uh, investigates the issue differently. And as I showed you with the example of the One Health, that's really hard. You know, <coughs> change the science system. But I mean, the idea is that you feed back. And then some things happen, and then you start again. Because probably your framing was wrong in the beginning, or whatever. Or you learn new things about the system, and then you have to reframe it. So that's the ideal process, right? Uh, those people from science, they usually just, what you do in, if you write a proposal is you describe the middle part, how you will analyze the problem. And you basically uh, say a few words about how you will have impact. And the framing, you do the framing on your own, basically. And I think in transdisciplinary research, you should have the same amount of money. It's just like a suggestion for the first part, for the middle part, and for the second part. That also means you don't have to underestimate the, the thinking and uh, money and the time that goes into exploring impact. Because usually at the end of the analyzing the problem, you have some ideas. What could be changed? Like the Jakob Zinstag with the nomadic people, right? He had some ideas of how, what to provide to the nomads, and then he needed like another five years to prototype that, to test the prototypes, to change them again, to, to rethink the whole um, model of the world he had in mind. That all needs very much time, right? It's not like just a policy brief. It's about writing the policy brief, sending the policy brief to somebody, testing what he or she will take out of that. Uh, getting this feedback, then perhaps coming to the insight that they don't really wait for policy briefs, but for something else, then it's to create that new thing. And so it's really a, a lot of work in that. Now, oh, sorry, yes? What I see is that even though you're co-producing the knowledge, you can have very different interpretations on yeah. how you run with that knowledge that happens. And this to me almost means like they could be very divergent in how the knowledge then develops. Like, so can you co-produce yet you don't know um, how it will develop if you think yeah. in the practical side versus on the scientific side? I think that could happen, but I mean, now just the next, I think I show it in the next slide, but I mean, it's a good comment. I'm also not sure who is doing the, who is doing what in the mm -hmm. graph, right? I mean, there's a lot of people involved in that, or 
two or one, I don't know. <laughs> but who is actually doing what? Who is doing the right-hand side, the left-hand side? That's kind of not decided. And I think there can be tons of options. Now I have to, um, an, I have to say a preliminary insight from a work uh, that Merit and we are doing from uh, uh, Tobias, who is looking at, um, who is interviewing stakeholders and, uh, I mean, who is lo looking at people who participated in such projects, asking them how would they frame such a process, what do they think is helpful in such processes, and I think one from the very preliminary results is that they are not so much interested in the outcome, but in a learning process. That's which is very, yeah, very interesting. Also takes a lot of pressure from transdisciplinary researchers who think they have to produce this impact at the end, mm -hmm. you know, with the product, with the policy brief. Not sure whether that will kind of go on like this, but it seems like really the red part is what they're interested in. Exchange, new ideas, mm -hmm. discuss, reframe things. Mm -hmm. So now, not sure whether I answer your question by that, but I try. So this is, again, in heaven, the ideal transdisciplinary research project. You have the topic. It's not a framed issue. It's a topic, hunger, right? Just a topic. And then you have different people that collaborate on that topic. Usually some of them are paid, some of them are not paid. And um, here I just took different disciplines again, ecology, biology, ethics, economics. And then some representatives of the private sector, the public agency, civil society, and then some uh, uh, disciplines that are more action research, right? That are more method oriented or systems analysis. So idly you have those people, they're all interested in collaborating. Actually the, the kind of boxes, that's how they think. That's a symbol of how they think, of their epistemologies. And then they come together and then they define problem, they have all the time and money to collectively define the problem. And then there are lots of interactions, that's the kind of lines between those. That's what I said before, what is when you ask me what is integration, all those lines are integration. You know? And that doesn't mean that the whole collective will learn the same thing. That could also mean that some of them learn specific things. Which then goes back to your question, is it, uh, is it then perhaps the civil society representative that takes something out of this? And then goes back to whatever, his NGO and tries to include that in the NGO. Also, I think already during this process, they learn a lot. And they go back to their workplace and they already, at the coffee break or whatever, they change things. It's not like only the output at the end. Also here, a lot of learnings happen, a lot of changes happen, right? Perhaps even more than at the end, I don't know. And then at the end, basically, uh, you go back to your original collective and try to convince them. If you learn something, you try to convince them that they should change their mind, and that's really hard. And I mean, uh, I think that's where the second quote of Mary comes in, the paradox situation. I think that was very well observed by Merit. Uh, all these processes take somehow place in a bubble and you decide and you discuss and things and you learn things and you get to new insights and you're still in the bubble. So what to do after that? That's like a paradox, like where we are, like or where we have been 2014. <laughs> but I think we still are there basically. <laughs> This, this was the first article I wrote after doing my interviews and with the, the pilot projects mm -hmm. here. And so it was pretty much questioning everything I thought about how, how applicable transdisciplinary could be because it just, mm -hmm. we didn't get there. Yeah. You know, and all this ideal things, everything we're talking about, I mean, it sounds so, intellectually it sounds so important mm -hmm. to put in everything. And so this was like, no, man, man it didn't work. What didn't work, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. I think that that's, um, but I mean, I still think, I mean, it's, I mean, like you say, it's more the learning, it's, there's so many yeah. different things. And, and it's also the time, I mean, how do you judge it? You know, Time-wise, things can also have a, a different type of impact. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I think there's a paradox. Like because you started with critiquing the linear flow of yeah. knowledge, yeah. and uh, which what we're saying is this is how we think it works, but it's not really how it works in a way. How, yes. how, yeah. 
these relationships and and uh, rather it seems like knowledge is emergent in it, it sort of goes where it wants to go yeah, exactly and, and we, yeah. we get these groups of people together yeah. and yeah. we can't we don't we can't really steer it in yeah. a way so in, so so in that sense your um, the homelessness is maybe always then true we yeah. want it we want to put place the knowledge with the king but the king is full of <laughs> got his head full of other things yeah. so it's it's home you know yeah. no matter how we look at it yeah. it, it seems like that this is predicament yeah. that we can't we can't control where knowledge goes in a way well it's also so the complexity of the problems because yes. if you're looking at these more overarching problems they don't they don't belong anywhere Exactly, and, that, and that's and that's yeah. like hunger, or like integration, yeah, exactly. So yeah. Migration yeah. issues. I mean, there's so many yeah. serious problems here that they, uh, we, we, you know, our, our sectors can't deal with them. I mean, that's mm. part of the problem is that we yeah. don't have the administrative or decision making structures to actually deal with these types because everything's yeah, divided. Yeah, give up. them home. Yeah, there's yeah. no, there's there's maybe ten homes, and they're all doing something just part of it. Yeah. <coughs> But I, th I think, I mean, for me, always the interesting part is we still spend quite a lot of money to have technology parks, uh, to have uh, public, uh, I mean, uh, scientific exhibitions, uh, and all those kind of things. Still a lot of money goes into that, even if mostly probably learning is taking place in this messy coincidences. Yeah. You know, that's, but that's perhaps okay, so we can live in our niche. Perhaps that's even better. <laughs> So now I, uh, I'll go into the boxes. So what is what actually is our understanding of those boxes? And our, I basically mean uh, a few people, not the world of transdisciplinarians, a few people that think like that. Um, and then we would like, I have a tool where you can explore your box, right, basically, which is uh, from the US. So we conceptualize the boxes as thought styles of thought collectives, that it was um, an idea introduced by Ludwig Fleck. Ludwig, Ludwig Fleck, back in the 1930s or so, quite a time ago. Ludwig Fleck is a Polish vi virologist, bio, biomedicine person. Uh, yes. Is it, is uh, it the same as epistemology? Because in the beginning you compared the two yourself. Yeah. I think it, it builds on epistemology, but it's more like uh, flu not so well defined like epistemology basically means groups of people there are groups of people that look at things in the same way mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. see things in the same way yeah. and uh, you you are probably part of several of those collectives mm -hmm. probably you're part of that one of your um, f formation of the professional formation professionalization is basically where we learn how to look at things in biology, in chemistry, mm -hmm. whatever, wherever you work as a farmer, <laughs> you, know, you learn how to distinguish relevant and irrelevant things part, as part of your education. And probably you are, the you are part of that professional thought collective, then perhaps you're of a thought collective of, I don't know, whatever sports you, you are, sports you fan, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you are in a church or in another belief system, you're part of that, then perhaps your family has a way of looking at things, I don't know. In Flex theory, this is all goes all in one theory, basically. You're part of different thought collectives where you look at things differently. Um, if you notice the book Scientific Revolutions of Thomas Kuhn, which is about paradigm shifts, so how the science system learned from looking at the world as a blood thing to a round thing, that's a paradigm shift. Uh, Thomas Kuhn basically took the theory of, of Fleck mm -hmm. and then made a big theory out of that. But he basically based his, all his knowledge on Ludwig Fleck. That now a really bad, there is only a very bad, I mean he's Polish and has written in German, this is a bad English translation yeah. of uh, thought styles, which you can read through.
But I mean, if you go into transdisciplinary endeavors, you will kind of see places where people talk to each other and they don't understand anything. They speak are in different worlds. What I like about Fleck is that he addresses also the feelings, that he says uh, thought styles are kind of um, deep convictions, deep assumptions of our, our personalities are linked to that. And if we met, meet people, uh, either we kind of really cannot connect to in any sense to them. That's like my experience with Bazarop. I just kind of connect. I look at the world. Bazarop Nicolescu, the spiritual man. It's so different. I can't connect. And with others, I can connect very easily. And for Fleck, that's like a sign of comparative, of uh, similar so thought styles. That's a, uh, an example of a thought, way of thinking of a thought style I had in my PhD. I did my PhD on uncertainties in life cycle assessment. Uh, life cycle assessment is like comparing different materials, whether they're good or bad for the nature or for ecology. And I did that with an engineer. And if we wanted to go a next step, the engineer would say it would make the right hand structure. What's the steps we have to go? What's the tasks? And how do they build on each other? And I would do a kind of a, you know, a mind map. <laughs> so we were really thinking completely differently. Addressing the same issue completely differently. But we managed quite well. And then there is another uh, quote of Yehuda Alkana, one of my teachers, a philosopher of science. That is about those, uh, explains different elements of the thought style. So he distinguishes a body of knowledge, which is basically what you know from your personal, uh, from your professional life. Or if you are educated as a biologist, it's all the biology concepts. It's the, 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 that you learn what questions are actually important right now. What is a good research question? What do we don't look at? Uh, we look at genes. Now we look at epigenetic environments, you know, but we don't look at feelings or things like that. All these kind of things you learn is the body of knowledge. And then there's a lot, what is more interesting is the image of knowledge. That's all what comes without saying, you know, where you kind of uh, uh, learn what is a good proof, what is a bad proof, what is a good evidence, what is bad evidence, which is very different in different disciplines, uh, what is truth anyway, <laughs> uh, how can I, what are so, uh, acceptable sources of knowledge, what not is revelation. I think that's like, just buff, I know it. Is that OK or not? <laughs> Should I criticize that or not? That's like the image of knowledge. And basically what Elkanah says, they teach you the body of knowledge, but there's a lot of implicit images of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if you go into an inter- and transdisciplinary um, uh, co-production, what clashes are the images of knowledge, basically. I mean, they clash at the level of uh, facts, <laughs> but based, that's where the, the expression is, but what clashes really are the images of knowledge, all the basic assumptions you have. And that's why uh, I would like to explore a tool that helps you to think about your assumptions that you, are, that you have in mind or don't have in mind. Before we do that, I'll say a few words more about uh, Ludwig Fleck, just one anecdote. So Ludwig Fleck um, uh, was a Jewish researcher who had to go to the, um, uh, uh, know, let me say, to the ghetto of Warsaw, I think, when he was prisoned basically by the Nazis. But he could work as a microbiologist there, or as a, viro as a, or a med biomedical person. Uh, and he had a contract with the, his Nazi head that uh, the results should be published by the Nazi head, right, basically. So Ludwig, uh, was, he was a real good uh, medical health, biomedical person. So he could create, apparently in the Warsaw ghetto, Jewish people would get sick of, now I don't remember except exactly what kind of uh, typhus or whatever the, the, the thing was, typhus or fleck fever, I don't know. And so he was able to create a vaccination from the urine of, of people who were sick. And so he used that to vaccinate, basically. Uh, the Jewish people in the, in the ghetto. And now how could he use the thought styles to um, protect the Jewish people? So when the Nazi person uh, realized that there was a vaccination, uh, he asked Ludwig Fleck whether this could also be used 
for German soldiers. And then knowing that, you know, Fleck knew that the Nazi person has to believe in the racist theory. So he said, no, no, impossible. This is Jewish people. <laughs> you have to take it from German people. <laughs> and apparently he could convince or, I don't know, the microbiologist believed or had to believe in this environment that this is true. So um, they had to go for German people to get the vaccination. So that is how Ludwig Fleck basically used his theory of thought styles that are strong kind of things that really make you believe in a specific way. He used that also in his life to protect people. It's a very interesting person. Now the tool. I go to the toolbox. Let's see whether I manage that. So we have a toolbox online. Uh, let me just see. Uh, together with the TDNet of the Swiss Academies, we have a toolbox where we provide tools to co-produce knowledge, basically. And I'd like to explore, let me see two of them today or so. And now I would like to use the, uh, where is it? The toolbox approach toolbox toolbox approach that was created by uh, philosophers from the US uh, Michael O'Rourke is and and uh, Stanford Eigenbrode and it's basically they had to run and Stanford Eigenbrode is a biologist and Michael O'Rourke is a philosopher and they basically had to run a transdisciplinary project in the US American sense different disciplines have to collaborate um, they realize that they have problems to understand each other. What do they take as a fact? What is a model? And things like that. And so he, um, Michael O'Rourke, as the philosopher, he provided just a set of questions about epistemologies, you know, about the way of perceiving things. And then they um, let the people answer those questions, and then they let the people discuss their answers of the questions. That's basically what we will do today. So you have, I think, I have uh, questions with me. Questionnaires, I don't know how many I have, actually. I think I have enough. And the next work for you would be... You see there are three pages of questions. You just go through them, you write your answers very quickly into that uh, boxes. I don't collect anything at the end, it's for yourself. And then after like 10 minutes, you go again into the groups and then you start wherever you like and you discuss. Take whatever answer or point you think is interesting and then you say your answer and then let's see what the others do. Are the groups mixed between the disciplines and yes and mm -hmm. practitioners? Mm -hmm. So it's an adaptation of the toolbox approach. Uh, we use that with um, uh, organic for, uh, an organic farming institute. Um, and try to include practical relevance much more. So it should be okay for practitioners. When I used it, when we used it at this institute, after five minutes, the first practitioner was so angry about this intellectual question, so he left the room, basically. That was okay. However, he still jumped in afterwards to join the discussion. Mm -hmm. So it is perfectly possible, if you don't like the questions, you do whatever you like, and you come back for the discussion. Is that okay? But I don't, you don't have to go through all the questions, just start with those questions that you think are most interesting. Mm -hmm. Take 10 minutes to answer them and then you have like 15 minutes to gr discuss in groups. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, include that break. <laughs> <laughs>